If someone's having a mental health crisis and is a danger to themselves or others, where can they go? Well, a lot of times they end up in the emergency room, but ER doctors say that's not the best place for them. We have very limited options. The biggest problems right now is indeed the whole system is backed up. Plus, have you ever wondered just how hard it is to climb Mount Hood? Ah. I think to me the biggest danger on this route is the rock and ice fall. We're going up the slopes with Portland Mountain Rescue. Here's the story. I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. All the ways to communicate with us right there at the bottom of your screen, and we do want you to communicate with us. You can email us. The address is the story at kgw.com. You can use the hashtag the story kgw on Twitter or leave us a voicemail. Just call our phone number 503-226-5090. One of the big problems many have with the homeless community in the greater Portland area and beyond is a fear that someone who looks calm might suddenly fly into a violent rage because of a mental health issue. And it does happen. Now I know many people who are homeless are not violent and not dangerous, but some are. And many of the ones who are don't get the mental care they need and are camping among those who are not dangerous. It's that unpredictability that worries many, including callers like Michael. I'm very concerned when I walk down our street, there are campers and I don't know, I don't know them. I know the people around me, but I'm very leery of walking by them. That from a lot of people. Ed wrote in to say, my wife in her car was hit with softball sized rocks doing thousands in damage. They caught the guy and he was released, no follow up by police. This was an unprovoked attack witnessed by two security guards. The guy was known for harassing people in the area and had been arrested many times. We need more social workers. Judith emailed in to echo what I heard from many of you. The dangerous folks with mental health issues should be taken off the streets. It's not a statement that those with mental health issues do not have a place in society, she wrote. They do in a safe place where they won't be a danger to themselves or others. Our community cannot function without a way forward on this issue. Well, that's just a sampling of the emails and phone calls that have come in over the last two days. This clearly is a huge problem that concerns many of you. So tonight we're going to explore the issue even deeper. Tuesday, I told you about a vicious attack on two 80-year-olds by a homeless man who said he'd lived on the streets of Portland for 13 years and worried about his own mental health. He has a long rap sheet. Last night, we talked with the executive director of the Oregon chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. He pointed out how hard it is to commit someone and get them help against their will. He also talked about hospital emergency rooms not being good places to handle mental health emergencies, even though that is where many of those people are first taken. And tonight we're talking with Dr. Sharon Myron, an emergency room doctor who's also a local politician, a Multnomah County Commissioner. She's running for election to become county chair, but I asked her to keep her comments as far away from politics as possible because her real value in this discussion is her insight as a physician. We need changes in the whole continuum of care because the problem is we don't have the right services available for people at the right time. And so they end up in crisis because they don't get the services they need beforehand before going to the emergency department. They end up in crisis and then there's nowhere for them to go. And that, you know, including places to go either other than the state hospital or from the state hospital. That, that is a problem, a big problem. And I, I feel like I've been singing this song for years because I have. She's talking about what happens long before someone ends up in the emergency room. That continuum of care means from the first time someone shows mental health problems, what happens then? And at the very beginning and the next steps that follow after that. Myron is saying the system is bad at getting those people help early. And you know what? It's exactly what we heard from the executive director of Oregon NAMI. Yeah, I, well, you know, when you go to your primary care physician and you articulate a problem for yourself or your child, primary care should be able to meet your needs, make the referrals, have integrated care, um, bring to bear medications if those are advisable, but also bring all the other treatment services that are necessary. So seeing skilled clinicians 
like a psychologist or seeing a licensed clinical social worker or others licensed to, to deliver um, uh, behavioral health care. In, in, in our medical field, we don't have seamless transition from I'm in front of you with a need and you help me find what I need in the behavioral health system. That doesn't really systematically occur. Um, other issues are, you know, you go to an emergency room right now, and emergency rooms will tell you if you're in a behavioral health crisis, we're the wrong place for you. So what they're both saying is that long before someone ends up chronically homeless, living on our streets for years and sometimes violent, there are opportunities to get them help and stop it from becoming so bad. But right now, many of those opportunities are missed. Well, is there something that could be done to make that ha work better? Yes, uh, it is. It is um, involves numerous systems uh, coordinating with each other and agreeing on an approach, and uh, it involves physicians and other healthcare providers it, being educated, you know, in medical school and what some of those treatments are. Uh, it involves having more providers specializing in mental health in the pipeline. So we get mental health providers so they can make those identifications. And frankly, it's private insurance in some ways is worse than public insurance and the Oregon health plan in terms of availability of mental health options. It is, I don't even want to say like pulling teeth because you can sort of find dentists, but it's, it's like, pull, like pulling teeth to, um, to be able to find a provider who can see you regularly, who meets your needs, who I, having personally experienced this with my own family, um, it, it can be a game stopper. And so all you're left with is someone declining uh, and ending up in crisis. And I, I was guessing that was why you were laughing, but just at the enormity of the problem and the changes systematically that would have to take place to have it really be a, a smooth operation. Yeah, no, that, that was a wry laugh of <laughs> um, just recognizing the, yeah, the enormity of it because, it, but it can happen. Like the fact that something is challenging doesn't mean that it can't happen. And it needs to happen. And we do have, um, you know, we have some of our uh, federal delegation, like Senator Wyden, I know, is working very hard to try to put things in place to make health systems accountable, uh, to ensure that there's parity between, like, that we treat mental health like all other forms of health care, and that we treat private insurance as, ironically, as we treat Medicaid. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of inequity in all of that across the board. Myron, an emergency room doctor, said the ER is not a great place to hold people who are having a mental health crisis, and yet that is often where they go. In terms of specific mental health crises, uh, if we have very limited options. And so if people come in in crisis and pose a danger to themselves or others, then we are obligated to uh, place them under a hold um, and uh, require that they stay until evaluated until evaluation by a professional, you know, who specializes in this. And uh, if they meet criteria, then they need to be admitted. If if indeed they are a danger to themselves or others, then they need to be admitted uh, for further evaluation. A lot of folks who come into the emergency department in crisis do meet that threshold criteria, but we're very limited in our background checks in what we know as emergency physicians. And so we are holding people, literally holding them in that single room, no windows often, waiting for them to have the place they can even go for the further evaluation. And that's an inpatient hospital setting. 
Now, another problem, even when people do get into treatment and get on medication that stabilizes them, there's often not enough care after that to keep them going. Adam wrote in to say that he works in the psychiatric care industry and added this. The residential facility gets them ready for the world and then after care falls through the cracks. And we're right back to the cycle of the person getting off medication, losing jobs, losing cars, losing friends, and ending up homeless. I shared that quote with Myron. She is familiar with the cycle. Exactly. It is a revolving door and we are not doing enough. I won't say anything. There are some, is some good work being done, but we are not doing enough to meet that need that you just described. There's not the place for people to go. And so there are some small things happening for some people but it is not at the quantity um, needed and there's still gaps in that continuum. All right, before we get too far down the rabbit hole here, what we've heard is that emergency rooms are not great places for people in mental health crisis, but there are few, if any, other options. Even if people do get stabilized, there's not enough follow-up care, and the type of insurance a person has makes a difference in whether they can get help before their mental health reaches a crisis. Now, let's circle back to the very beginning on what needs to change to make it easier to get people who are chronically homeless and have mental illness and are dangerous and violent how to get those people off the street. It is also interconnected. It's hard to just to be able to focus but some of the solutions we really can focus on and what I think um, are, are important are, number one, working on criteria to be able to treat people if they're incapable of making medical decisions and they pose a risk to themselves or others, um, or even if they don't, but they are so so disabled that they are unable to care for themselves. And we see a lot of people who are like that living outside. So we need to change our statutes to meet the needs. And that's going to be controversial because there are a lot of conflicting interests. We need to come together, have the conversations, and come with the, up with a plan that keeps people, both the individuals themselves and the community at large, safe. And that so would be that's, a state legislature conversation? It's a state legislature conversation. Yep. Yeah. Myron said lawmakers are studying the question to see what they could do in the next legislative session, but that's going to take some time. And that's why we still have chronically homeless people on our streets with mental illness who might be dangerous. What do you think about all that? Shoot me an email, let me know. Our address is thestory at kgw.com, or you could call and leave a voicemail, 503-226-5090. Still ahead, it's hard enough to climb Mount Hood. It's even harder to do it as a mountain rescuer. We'll go up with a team that's always ready to go when someone needs help. That's when the story continues.
Welcome back. Keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com. I see a lot are already coming in on the mental health issue. A lot of passion behind that. It's why we spent three nights focused on it. You could also give us a call and leave a voicemail at 503-226-5090. Climbing Mount Hood and watching the sun come up while standing at the summit is a worthy bucket list goal for anyone. It is a spectacular experience. Not everyone makes it to the top, but recently our John Goodwin did with the help of an all woman team of mountaineering experts from Portland Mountain Rescue. So it's interesting, these alpine climbs that start at midnight, one, two o'clock in the morning, they can have a, a, a definite effect on your psyche. And so that's part of the adventure, I think. An alpine start at the Timberline parking lot combines sleep deprivation with an overflow of adrenaline. Somewhere up there in the darkness sleeps Mount Hood, or is known by its Native American name, Y East. I see the pickets. So the plan is to summit Mount Hood, and over the weekend it did snow, I don't know, between five and 10 inches up in the crater. So environment, as always, I'm amber. Um, I just like to be vigilant and assess as we go. I meet four members of Portland Mountain Rescue who wear many impressive helmets. Teresa Delsager, a former corporate VP, ER Dr. Jenna Wiley, and firefighter EMT Haley Ducats, led by rescue leader and biology professor Paige Bacher. I'm a rescue leader with PMR, so I'll be leading this team. Um, are you green, amber, or red with my leadership? Green. 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 If everyone would like to put their beacon into search mode, so you're going to read the numbers out, and they should be getting smaller 20, to get closer to you. 1, 6, 1, 3, oh, 9. And Final safety checks and first footsteps on crunching snow make what's about to happen very real. All right, John, how are you feeling about uh, the plan? I'm going to go Let's green go. because of who I'm with, and I'm also going to go amber because of who you're with. <laughs> <laughs> this south side route is the most common. The climber's trail is groomed by snow cats, giving us a nice lane up to the top of the Palmer chairlift. After a few hours, the mountain's cathedral-like features appear. We're above the Palmer chairlift, just past Illumination Rock, and I'm looking up at Crater Rock. There's my awesome team up there, <laughs> dragging me up the mountain slowly. It's crampons from here on out, and it gets steep. Mount Hood is not just a walk up mountain. It's not a hike, it's not a backpack, and it requires comfort with using crampons and ice axe. It requires hazard reading and risk mitigation. We're just below the hog's back. Just got above Devil's Kitchen, and what do you know? A little sunshine peeking into the crater for us. This little area over here is from rural sections called Hot Rocks. The hog's back is a ridge of snow with volcanic vents called fumaroles on either side. The sulfuric aroma is strong up here and you do not want to fall and slide into one of these vents. PMR has made many rescues here. And so if you fall in, um, you can be looking at like upwards of like a 50 foot vertical fall onto rock down below you. And then you're trapped in this cylinder of snow and poisonous gases. This is really the only place definitely in North America, if not the world where there are active fumaroles on such a popular climbing route. Use this as my mirror. I learned my lesson from last week. <laughs> I got roasted. The most technical part of the climb begins as the goal comes into view. Good footwork and focus carries you up. Teresa captured these photos showing the size and scale of the mountain looking back to the south. We are on the Bergstrand, um, and what a Bergstrand is, it's a place in the glacier where the glacier actually pulls away from the rocks. Um, it's, it's extremely well filled in right now, um, so we are building a spot here for to rope you in, basically. Haley prepares to set pickets for me so I don't go from climber to liability. Where we're standing is a short traverse away from the pearly gates. And notice Paige's hoop earrings. It's a vibe I will forever strive for. Is rope flaked? It is. Well, I, I had it on a pretty good coil, so I think it should be good if you good to go. As the sun beats down, Thanks. it drains you. Yeah. Ah, and thaws out other dangers. There's rime ice coming down. Oh, yeah, I see it. Ice! 
Ice! And once that sun starts hitting it, it starts to loosen it up. And big, the biggest, I think, me, the biggest danger on this route is the rock and ice fall. For a minute, it threatens to turn us back. Okay, so I do, now that I stand up, I can see someone um, knocking that down. Copy that. Okay, good. Go. If you just go straight up. We push up to the right chute of the pearly gates, where you're surrounded by wind-blown rime ice. It's stunning, but imagining chunks of it falling off as you climb isn't very fun. You are now off the way, okay? Okay. Mountaineering is a very specific um, activity, and it takes something special. All the guts and focus and determination and concentration and faith and hope and all the things that life throws at you. Pushing through, getting up after a fall, and the exhaustion melted away by satisfaction. Taking in the view wasn't what I'll take away. It's the makeup of this selfless team of strong women. Historically, Mountain Rescue doesn't have a lot of women involved in it. And I am incredibly proud of this training class because we have such incredibly strong women. I mean, the three that you went up with today, incredibly strong women. And we're all volunteers. We show up because we want to give to this team. And, and that's a pretty powerful statement, I think. White East means different things to different people. And I have a new respect for what that is. You may climb it, but you'll never conquer it. Thanks to these pros, I got home safely, and many more have too, because of PMR. You can be strong, you can be confident, you can be tough, you can be kind and compassionate all at the same time, and that will be appreciated and recognized. High five! five. Woo! <laughs> Congratulations, John. For the rest of your life, you'll be able to look up at the top of that mountain and say, I stood at the top. By the way, I had a chance to talk with one of the Portland Mountain Rescue leaders this morning. He said he hopes John's story encourages more women climbers to join their team. When we come back, Washington is about to change the way police shootings are investigated. A new state law set up an independent team that was supposed to be ready to go July 1st but it's already July 7th, and the promising program is a long way from even filling out its staff. What the new director has to say about that when the story continues.
If a police officer shoots and kills someone, detectives from nearby departments will typically be the ones to investigate whether that shooting was justified. But some think that can lead to biased outcomes in favor of the officer. So Washington State created an independent agency to handle those cases instead. They are the first in the country to do so. Those investigations were supposed to start last week, but the agency's director says they're months away from being able to take on any cases. Drew Mickelson looked into why. This newest state agency is so new, they don't have a logo or a building yet, but they were supposed to be up and running last week on July 1st. But in his first TV interview, the new director says they're just not ready. When a police officer uses deadly force in this state, investigators from surrounding agencies, usually neighboring communities within the same county, take up the case and present findings to a prosecutor for a decision on criminal charges. And I am signing. But last year, lawmakers wanted to take those nearby investigators out of the picture. So they created a new state agency, the Office of Independent Investigations made up of civilians to investigate those cases. Legislators wrote into the law that they were motivated by an outpouring of frustration, anger, and demand for change. Our job is to find the truth. Our job is to do competent, unbiased, anti-racist um, investigations and to do them in the right way. Last month, Governor Jay Inslee appointed Roger Rogoff as the agency's first director. They listened to all the evidence. The former federal and county prosecutor and King County Superior Court Justice says the justice system has room for improvement. Well, anytime you don't have uh, trust after some of the incidents that we've seen over the last 10 years, there's absolutely room to do it differently and do it better. Um, and that's what we're, we're hoping to do. State law required the investigations to start last week, but the agency is not ready. The office is borrowing cubicle space until a permanent location is built, and the state's only hired about 10% of the staff. Rogoff says they're months away from taking on cases. What do you say to people who are going to say, well, look, they're already falling out of the gate here? Sure, and I think we would be falling out of the gate if we started conducting investigations when we weren't ready to conduct investigations. We won't be falling out of the gate if when we take that first case, we know what we're doing, we know we're doing it in the right way, um, and we handle those cases competently and in an unbiased way. Once the investigations begin, those investigators won't have the ability or authority to charge anyone. That still will be up to a county prosecutor. But there are lawmakers here in Olympia who want to eventually change that. All right, that was Drew Mickelson. Keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com. When we come back, how you can get a jump start on helping school kids in your community.
Before we go, I want to remind you of a summer tradition that's returning to KGW, the school supply drive. It kicks off in August, but we really need your help to get ready right now. Sign up your organization and we'll send a collection kit so that you can help collect school supplies for your school district. Last year, we collected school supplies for more than 15,000 kids. Just go to KGW.com schools for all the details.